Hi everybody, welcome back to another video on Feynman integration. Today we're going to be evaluating this integral right here. Integral from 0 to infinity of cosine x over x squared plus 1 dx. And like always, we're going to be uh, creating, you know, actually first off, I want to say uh, for this video, it would help if you had a uh, some knowledge of differential equations. Um, we will be using or solving a uh, second order homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients um, as part of the process of solving that integral. Um, anyway, what we'll do, like always, create a function of t. That function of t is the integral from 0 to infinity of cosine tx over x squared plus 1 dx. Very familiar process, what I just did right there. Um, of course, we're going to find some, uh, some initial or some values for that at different points. Um, notice that f evaluated at the point 0, where t is equal to 0, gives you pi over 2, because that'll give you cosine of 0, which is 1. 1 over x squared plus 1 integrated from 0 to infinity with respect to x is pi over 2. And of course, if you plug in 1 for t, you get our original integral i right there. Um, so using the Leibniz rule, we get that f prime of t is equal to negative infinity, or I'm sorry, negative integral from 0 to infinity of x times sine tx over x squared plus 1 dx, which is equal to this. Um, I'm going to show you the, uh, the process for how I actually got from here to there, just as soon as I find my pen. So right now, these don't look anything alike. This and this don't look anything alike. I'm just going to show you uh, quickly how I got there. So the first thing I do is I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom of this equation right here by x. No problem there, right? We multiply the top and the bottom by x. Doesn't change a thing. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce inside the parentheses a plus 1. So now that does change things. So we just did something to the equation. I apologize for the quality of my, uh, my marker. Um, but as you can see, that did change things. What that did is that introduced a whole other part to the integral. Um, since we added that plus 1, what we've really done is subtracted the integral from 0 to infinity of sine tx over x times x squared plus 1 dx. Um, so what we have to do is subtract, I'm sorry, add it to the end of the function, and that part's right here. Um, for, the fir for this part, all, all I'm doing is basically crossing these things out. So uh, hopefully you can, you can see now that this is equivalent to this. And we're going to use a result that we've found many, many times before, and that is that this integral right here will evaluate to negative pi over 2. Okay, so now we're going to do something a little bit different that we haven't done yet. I promise we'll do it again in later videos, but we're going to be differentiating under the integral sign again. So we're going to find f double prime of t by applying the Leibniz rule to this thing right here. This is a constant, so it drops out when you, uh, when you differentiate it. So we're really just taking the, uh, the partial derivative with respect to t of this thing right here. And what you get when you do that is that f double prime of t is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of cosine of tx over x squared plus 1 dx, which is exactly equal to f of t. You can see that right here. So, um, that gives us the equation that f double prime of t is equal to f of t. And that's why I stated at the beginning that it would be helpful if you knew a little bit about differential equations. So that's what's called a second order homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients. And it's not even a very difficult one. I'm not going to uh, show why 
uh, you get the general solution for that differential equation that you do. Uh, there's plenty of videos online about that. I recommend Khan Academy, Khan Academy to learn about differential equations. So in, in any case, the general form of our solution is given by this function right here. f of t is equal to some constant a times e to the t plus some other constant b times e to the negative t. Um, so the standard, uh, since we have initial values, since we have values for this, uh, for this equation, we have values for f of t, we have values for f prime of t, and we have values for f double prime of t. Um, I hope you can see how I got f prime of t and f double prime of t down here. I basically just differentiated both sides with respect to t. When you differentiate this with respect to t, you get that. And then uh, for finding f double prime of t, you can literally just copy this part because we've already shown that they're equal. Or you can just differentiate this again. Um, but anyway, there's our expressions for f, f prime, and f double prime of t. Uh, now what we need to do is use the initial values um, that we have for f evaluated at zero and f prime evaluated at zero and also f double prime evaluated at zero. So we already know that f evaluated at zero is equal to pi over two. This step, I have a problem with. This f prime evaluated at zero being equal to negative pi over two. Because up here, you see, we have written down f prime of t twice. This is f prime of t, according to the Leibniz rule, but so is this. And this, as we've shown before, is equal to negative pi over two for all values of t not equal to zero. So why is it correct to pick f prime of 0 equal to negative pi over 2, which I have. That will give us, ultimately, that will give us the correct solution for i. But why is it not correct, I'm wondering, to pick f prime evaluated at 0 equaling 0? Because you can see, if you plug in 0 here, this whole thing evaluates to 0. I wish I had a good answer for you. I don't. Um, it probably has something to do with a uh, with what I discussed in my first video on the Leibniz rule, where I kind of showed why this is true generally, and I would imagine it has something to do with restrictions on passing a limit inside of an integral, um, especially when you have an improper integral like this going from zero to infinity. Um, but in any case, I know that picking f prime of zero, uh, being equal to pi over two is the, is the correct thing to pick because it gives you the right answer. I verified this answer, uh, with contour integration and with a calculator. That's, this is definitely the answer that we get. Um, let me think, where was I? Oh yeah. So we have uh, the expressions for f of t, f prime of t, and f double prime of t. And when we plug in our values for those, we get the following system of equations. We get that pi over 2 is equal to a plus b, and we get that negative pi over 2 is equal to a minus b. And as you can see, if you add these two equations together, you'll get that 0 is equal to 2a, giving you a equals 0. And if you plug in a equals 0, you get that either b is equal to pi over 2 or that negative b is equal to negative pi over 2. In either way, you get that b is equal to pi over 2. So plugging in a and b for our general into our general solution here, we get that f of t is equal to pi over 2 times e to the t. And then plugging in 1, we get that i is equal to pi over 2e. Um, if anybody has a, a, a good explanation as to why it's, uh, it's correct to plug in zero into this equation when determining f prime of zero 
as opposed to plugging it in in this one, I would really appreciate it if you leave it in the comments. Um, I'm going to try to research that myself and maybe tack on an addendum to this video um, at a later date explaining uh, why it's correct to choose f prime of zero equaling negative pi over two. But for now, um, this is the best I got, so I hope you enjoyed that.